Okay, then I think we might as well uh, crack on. Um, thank you all for coming. This is all good. Um, you do realise that Rob Connery's down in room one. He's doing a talk about Cassini and space and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, don't blame me. I would too. Um, but sadly, you've got me, and I'm um, stuck here. We're going to have uh, a bit of a talk about how to parse a file. We're going to have a look at some sort of structured parsing kind of stuff and some things that maybe you've had a look at, but maybe not since uh, university or something, if you haven't uh, looked at it at all. Um, and we're going to start kind of nice and easy and uh, simply and say, don't. Don't parse files. It's not worth it. It's a, it. This isn't your problem. This is somebody else's problem. We've got lots of general purpose programming languages. It's not your speciality, it's not your business, it's not your, uh, the thing that's going to deliver value to your customers. So generally speaking, don't parse files. Use XML, use YAML, use CSV, use anything. Don't do it yourself. That's my top tip. So, plenty of time to go and catch Rob Connery. It's good. Um, but uh, finally, if you do want to stay and everything, we can sort of say, why would we want to parse a file? There, there, there are still some reasons for doing the parsing yourself. And I can think of a, a handful, really. Um, the, kind of the first one, really, I think would be sort of speed or efficiency. Perhaps the general purpose parser you've got isn't fast enough for your use case. Perhaps you've got a really big file which takes a long time to parse, or lots and lots of small files, which is then uses a lot of memory or something. You know, um, so um, that's a good reason, but you've got to uh, sort of think about the, the trade-offs that are involved, the, the maintenance costs that you're taking on by writing your own parser and building your own uh, parser. Another reason might be to reduce dependencies. Perhaps you're working in a, a resource-constrained environment. You know, if you're on mobile or something, you don't want to take on another dependency on a, a, a general purpose parser. Uh, and again, that's a useful thing. Custom or simple file formats. If using a custom file format, you don't really have much choice. You have to parse something. You have to do something with that. If it's something nice and simple, it's possibly quick and easy enough to, uh, to parse yourself, uh, and that's uh, good going. But similarly, you might want to then sort of switch to a more general purpose language and just use uh, off-the-shelf components as a way to doing that. The next one's a really good reason, I think. Um, it's something that isn't uh, a file, that isn't uh, something that can't really be represented uh, nicely in a general purpose language, something like a, a DSL, a domain-specific language. And th there's plenty of sort of examples of this, you know, things like make files. So uh, make is a good example there. You know, that's got its own custom file format. But then there's a sort of the flip side to that. You've got things like Cake, which is just C-sharp. You've got Fake, F-sharp, Rake, which is, there's a theme here, isn't there? It's Ruby. Um, and so, you know, you, again, those don't need custom parsing. That's just a, uh, using a language. Even um, Gradle is using Groovy. There's things like uh, command line options, HTTP headers, perhaps. Uh, but again, there's likely general purpose uh, uh, languages, uh, sorry, libraries out there which you can use for that kind of thing. Parsing standard out is a good one if you just want to get the output of a file and, uh, and see what's happened, capturing the output and handling that. Or other things, things that are like might be a natural language uh, command, so uh, something which you can just type into a, an application uh, straight on. So uh, Utrack, for example, issue tracker, you can just type work 10 hours and it'll add it on and knows what to do with that kind of thing. The other reason, though, is, is kind of where I come in. It's, it's where we're just as interested in the structure of the file as its contents. So not just the, uh, the actual data that's in there, but how it's, uh, how it's structured, how it's formatted. So we'll, we'll just wind back a bit. And this is me. Hello. That's what I look like on the internet. Uh, I work for JetBrains. I'm a developer and developer advocate. And if you don't know JetBrains, we build a lot of IDEs. If you've got a language, there's likely an IDE for it. And the way we build IDEs is the interesting bit, because we build a parser for every single file type. And we understand the structure of the files, uh, and we use that to build features. We can use that structure and the semantic knowledge from that to build navigation, syntax highlighting, refactoring, inspections, and so on. And in fact, if you kind of uh, did a back of the napkin architecture diagram of what an IDE, JetBrains IDE looks like, you'd come up with something like this. You've got a base platform at the bottom, which is kind of like file handling. Um, UI, that kind of thing. Project model, what files are we working with? What are the compilation options? And then we've got this nice section here, PSI, Program Structure Index. That's where all the fun stuff happens. We parse all the files, we get our semantic uh, and structural information, we cache it and we do all that kind of thing. And then, and this is the key bit, the big thing at the top, features. That's all the features we have. Those are all the inspections, the quick fixes, the refactorings, the navigation, everything. And the key thing is that it sits on top of the PSI. It's really important. So if we have a PSI, if we have this structural information of the code, we can build a whole load of stuff. But the flip side is, if we don't have that, we've got nothing. So it's, a, it's an interesting sort of uh, model that's going on there. And where I come into all of this is that I've been working on the Unity support in Rider. And Unity for, uh, everyone know what Unity is? 
uh, yeah, brilliant. It's absolutely massive. It's um, powering, if you've got any game on your phone, good chance are that it's, um, it's written in Unity. It's got its own um, file format for shader support, for doing things with the GPU. And that's about as much as I understand it, things with the GPU. Uh, and uh, I wanted to add that into, into Rider and ReSharper, and we need, wanted syntax highlighting for that, and code folding, and all these kinds of things. And to do that, I need that PSI level. And so I wanted to parse uh, shader lab files, and uh, it ended up being a lot of fun. And so I thought, right, if it's a lot of fun and interesting to me, and a lot of interesting challenges and interesting problems, then I'm going to go and tell you a lot as well. Misery shared. It's great. So what am I trying to build? What do I want out of this? Um, I've already said that I want to know about the structure and the syntax of the file, and we end up with a tree like this, which is going to represent uh, all of the data that we've got. I can show it to you in, in real time. Uh, on the left, we have a shader file from a Unity project. Um, there's no syntax highlighting in this one, unfortunately. That's the way it goes. Um, and we kind of have blocks at the top which describe everything. We can have properties here with colors uh, and so on. And it's a sort of a structured uh, file format. It's a sort of hierarchical thing. Uh, and we can map it on the right-hand side there to a parsed version of the file. And so this is our sort of syntax tree that represents everything we've got here. So we have a shader lab file at the top. That breaks down into a, a shader command. And inside that, we've got um, a keyword for the, which maps to shader, and then shader values. And it kind of drops down and goes in um, sort of hierarchical order from that. And given this information, we can do lots of fun things. So for example, we can recognize colors and highlight them and do fun stuff like that. So how do we do this? How do we build this? How do we parse a file in brackets for an IDE? So that's my use case. I want to build it for an IDE. Um, by the way, if anybody has any questions at any time, please shout out and we can uh, uh, address those. So we can start simply. We can have a naive parser, which is incredibly naive, and it just kind of walks through each uh, character in turn and sort of looks at it and um, compares it. Is it an S? OK. Is it an H? Is it A, D, E? OK, I've matched shader. Brilliant. Now do this. Um, and yeah, fine, it'll work and everything, but you don't want to do this. This is not well architected, not well designed, not useful, not maintainable. It's terrible. What we want to do is, uh, is re-architect it. We want to split it up a little bit, split up the responsibilities. We want to be able to read our individual characters and identify the specific building blocks of this file format, things like keywords, identifiers, the, the punctuation or the, the operators, or semicolons, the open brackets, and so on. And then once we've got all that, we want to use that information to recognize the more complex constructs, the blocks, the uh, if we're defining a property, the sort of the, the name of the property and the value of it, you know, if it's a color, um, what type of color it is, and so on, and then do something with that. So that what we want to do depends on our application. For for myself, it's an IDE, so I'm going to be building this PSI layer, layer from our uh, architecture diagram. But if you're doing something else, you might want it to to write out values at that point. You know, so you're streaming things as your uh, as you're parsing your file, or you might want to sort of uh, save that information, build a, new, a different kind of data structure to save at the end. But we want to split up these responsibilities and do something with it. Fortunately, somebody's already done this for us. Somebody's already got this architecture set for us. Uh, and we can go back to the archetypal uh, example of a, uh, a parser and look at the compiler. The compiler is a very structured parser that we've got here. And it's kind of, the compiler's kind of split into two parts, a front end and a back end. And the front end is the bit which we're interested in. It does all the actual parsing. The back end is the bit which generates code and uh, does all fun stuff like that. So if we have a look at the front end bit, this actually maps nicely to what we want to do in the IDE as well. So that's also useful. But we split into three things. We've got lexical analysis, syntactic analysis, and then finally semantic analysis, which um, uh, we can then use for our parsing. We've got a lexer, a parser. And we end up with a result. In our case, in my case, sorry, the result is going to be some semantic analysis. So what are lexers and parsers? So lexers, we'll start with that. This performs lexical analysis. Uh, and lexical is something that relates to words or vocabulary or something. So this recognizes keywords, recognizes identifiers. It breaks down a big block of text into smaller chunks which we can manage, which we can do something with. So it's going to take our file, it's going to take a big block of string of text and convert that into a stream of tokens. So we're going to gener generate a token to represent each individual thing in our file format. And that can be an identifier, a comment, it could be white space, it could be string literals, 
um, or it could be uh, any kind of uh, operator or punctuation. One of the key things with lexers is that our tokens are lightweight. Generally, it's just an integer value. All you need to do is be able to identify this is a comment, this is a bit of white space. So they're quite often just an integer uh, value. Uh, in my case with Resharpa um, in the IDE, they're actually uh, singleton object instances because it gives us a bit more information on there. But once we've got our tokens, uh, parsing them becomes a lot easier because all we need to do now is match, uh, instead of having to sort of figure out what this block of text means, we've just got a list of tokens. and We just have to match against these tokens. So for example, with an expression, if you had integer uh, followed by the plus operator symbol followed by an integer, you know you've got an expression. So that's a lot easier to parse than the, the digits 1, 2, 3, plus 4, 5, 6. And because of this, then, lexers can actually be harder to write than a parser. The parser can be a lot easier because you're just pattern matching over this stream of tokens. So what do we get out of a lexer? So um, we, what we, have, we say we're going to get a, a stream of tokens. Uh, and on the left here, we've got an example of the file format itself. This is the structured file format with the keywords, with string literals, with braces, and so on. And on the right, then, we have a stream of tokens that matches this. So we start off with an end-of-line comment, and it tells us what the, the value of that is. We've got new lines, we've got shader keyword, we've got white space, a string literal, and so on. So it's just a stream of tokens. Can I ask, so how, how is a lexer really different to a parser? Because the lexer is itself pattern matching to find that thing that is a comment or that is a new line. So it's, match, it's matched, for example, that number 26 is um, a character to a new line. And then the parser seems to be just doing the same thing Yes, so the question is, what is the difference between a lexer and a parser? Because a lexer is, um, we, you know, we're just showing that a lexer is going to pattern match on characters to produce tokens, and then the parser is pattern matching on tokens to produce bigger constructs. And in that respect, um, they are conceptually similar. However, it's just what level they're doing it at, and it's splitting up the responsibility. So the lexer is responsible for converting a big block of text into something smaller and manageable that we can work with and that the smaller manageable thing is a stream of tokens. And the parser then just needs to work with the stream of tokens rather than having to parse it each individual character as it goes through. So would, could there potentially be value in yet another layer of something that took the output of the parser and did something equivalent to all of that? <coughs> yeah, and so again the question is could, that be, could there be other layers on top of that which will take the output of a parser and do something useful for it? Yes, watch this space. Um, so uh, is, is everybody okay with lexers and stuff so far? Awesome. Right, next thing then, lexers, they're a solved problem. They've, they've been around for absolutely ages, and uh, they have been written for us. You, you can use, uh, we can work with this. So you can use a lexer generator, basically. You don't have to write one yourself. You can use uh, a lexer generator, things like lex, the granddaddy of them all, which is uh, nearly as old as I am. I'm not a granddaddy, hang on. Oh. Uh, then we've got Flex, which is a slightly better version of Lex. Then there's things like CS Lex for C Sharp, um, FS Lex for F Sharp, J Flex for uh, Java, and so on. It's basically been ported uh, and improved and, and made different for each different platform that you're working with. So what does it look like? What does the input of this look like? Um, traditionally, this Alexa, is, Alexa file is split into three parts. You've kind of got a, a, an intro part at the top, which is just user code, and this just gets thrown into the output. Uh, then you get a, a, a middle part for declarations where you define um, directives, such as the, uh, the namespaces you're going to use, the class names, the interfaces, and so on. And then you declare some regular expression macros, declare some states. And then finally, your last part down at the bottom is a whole load of rules and actions. And those rules are the regular expressions we're going to match, and then the action that we're going to do. And the action is most frequently return a token. Yeah, regular expressions. So everybody who has told you that you don't use regular expressions to parse HTML has been lying to you. So <laughs> don't quote me on that. That's terrible. Um, OK, so uh, let's have a look at a Lexa class. So this is, the, can everyone see that one OK? Oh, yeah, we're right with that. Good stuff. So this is a Lexa, Lexa file for the Shade Lab file format. At the top there, we've just got a bunch of using statements. These will get copied to the output file. Uh, just as is. There's a bunch of um, definitions. For example, there's a namespace there. That's going to be the, the namespace that gets generated, the name of the class that we generate, more boring stuff like that. And then we start to hit our regular expressions. So here's one, for example. This is 
uh, defining new line characters, and these are going to be the new line characters that we're going to match. Uh, and the, the braces around that are referencing other macros. So we've got a, uh, a file which we bring in which just includes a whole load of characters for us so that we don't have to use backslash r, black, backslash n everywhere. But these are defining all the characters that represent new lines. Uh, so we've got standard carriage turn, line feed, but also Unicode stuff, because we also need to deal with Unicode. We need to remember to handle that. Uh, we can then uh, build those up into a slightly more complex regular expression, whereby it's, we've got uh, an optional CR, CR question mark, optional carriage return, followed by a line feed, or it's just a carriage return by itself, or it's just a, uh, I forget what NL stands for, but one of the Unicode um, line break uh, characters or page break, char paragraph break par oh, characters, uh, and so on. And as we go down, we get kind of more interesting regular expressions as well, so we can define a decimal digit, or we can have an integer literal, well, I like that one, integer literal, which is a minus symbol followed by one or more decimal digits, and so on. So, regular expressions. And then finally, we get our block of rules which match against uh, actions and so on. So, for example, here we have an equal sign, and the action we do just there is just return, just return the token, which is <coughs> equals. So it's nice and straightforward. It's, it's really quite a uh, straightforward thing. We have the regular expressions which des describe something. Um, let's show a, a, something which actually is a regular expression. So there's our integer literal, for example. And then there's the token that we return at the end of it. And so we're splitting up our code based on regular expressions. Sorry, we're splitting up our input file based on regular expressions and returning back tokens. Is everybody happy with that? Kind of quick overview of what a file looks like. Okay, so how does, oh, sorry, we had a question there. Is, 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 that, a, is that file format for one particular lexer, or is they all use the same thing? Um, it's, so the question was, is that file format uh, specific to a particular lexa, or are they all uh, using the same file format? They're not using the same file format, but they're all very, very similar. So they're all, basic, they're all pretty much based on lex from 1975. And so they're all very, very similar. Uh, they will have different capabilities with the reg regular expressions. They will have other different things with the directives, but they'll be very similar, and they pretty much all follow that pattern. So it's, uh, it's very similar. All right, so how does it work? The Lexer, when it's run on that input file, will generate some source code. So it's not generating binaries or DLLs or anything like that. It just generates some source code, and that will be included in your project, and it'll be built, and it'll do the work for you. All of the rules, which are regular expressions, get converted into a single finite state machine. And that means that all of our regular expressions are combined and matched at the same time. And that's really cool. <laughs> you don't believe me, but it is. Um, this then gets encoded into state transition tables, which means everything is all done by lookups. And the lookups are based on the characters and the current state of where we are in the uh, transitions. Uh, and that means it's very fast and it's very efficient. So we're not allocating loads of memory. We're not running crazy regular expressions. We've got a limited subset of regular expressions that we can do. Uh, and it's all done through uh, input lookup tables. It also means that the code is not very maintainable. So if we look at the generated code off the back of this, it gets very, very scary very, very quickly. So these, wait a minute, I'm just still scrolling. Uh, <coughs> da, da, da. There we are, oh no, more arrays. Uh, Oh, there we go, and then there's, there's the code. It gets scary quickly. It's not easy to maintain. It's not easy to, uh, terribly easy to debug, um, but it, it's uh, very good and it is very efficient. So it's a bit of a trade-off there with uh, maintainability, <laughs> there isn't any, and uh, efficiency. So I wanna kind of, one of my reasons for doing this talk was looking at that file and going, what on earth is happening in there? And so it was like, well, if I submit a talk, that means I have to find out what all that arrays are doing. So I'm going to tell you. Um, we'll even take this as an example, uh, regular expression. So it's a, a simple regular expression, A followed by a B or a C, followed by zero or more Ds, followed by one or more Es. So nice and straightforward. We can represent that as a state transition diagram. So we start at state zero. We can then have an A, we move to state one. We can either have a B or a C, and we move to state two. From there, we can have a D, and we stay at state two, so we could have zero or more Ds. And then we can have an E, which moves us to state three, at which point uh, we can have extra Es, so we've already got a one, so our 
more ease going there, and we either terminate or we keep going at, um, at the final state. Does that, is that clear to everyone? Awesome. We can represent this as a table, and this is effectively what's going on inside that file. We've, the, the indexes, the arrays, effectively map that table. And the table has elements for all of the characters that you're going to match, and, uh, and in, uh, something that happens at that point. So we can either match it and move to a new state. We can accept the, uh, the, the, the pattern, and we've, we've, that means we're at the end of our regular expression, or we've got an error, nothing matches. So we start at state zero, and let's say we, hit, we, we get the character B. Uh, state zero with B is an error, so that's no good. We don't match that. But if we get A, we match uh, and we move to state one. And now we're at state one. If we get A, we get an error, it doesn't work. But if we get a B, we match, we can move to state two. At which point, if we get a D, then, oh, right, well, that's our zero or more. So um, if we get a D, we stay on state two, and we loop, and we can carry on looping. But if we get an E, we match, and we move on to state three. And state three is our final state. And if we get an E, again, we're looping here because it stays at state three. Or if it's anything else, well, then it's, it's, we're at, we've hit accept state. And we've matched, and there we are. We've, we've, we've matched the token. And then at that point, the Lexer will do the action we've got, return the token we've matched. Does that make sense? Awesome. Because <laughs> it gets better. We can match two rules at the same time with the same uh, table. So with the diagram there, we've added on an extra bit. The first state, we can either match A as before, or we can match uh, any of the characters between 0 and 9. That will take us to a new state, which at that point we can match 0 to 9 again, and it stays at uh, state 4, or we end. So again, we start at state 0. If we got our A, we would just go the route we just went, and everything's fine. Ooh. Or we could get um, a 0 to 9 character. And at that point, we then we match state, uh, we match and we move to state four, our new state down at the bottom. At this point, if we match again another zero or nine, then we match and we stay at state four and we loop. Otherwise, anything else, it says, right, okay, that's it, we've accepted and we've matched. <coughs> and so that allows us to match multiple regular expressions at the same time with a uh, table-based lookup, which is really cool and really efficient. But don't make me write those arrays by hand. I've got no idea. So um, it's very cool. We've got a uh, lookup in the state transitions table. It's very fast. It's very efficient. There are no allocations going on there, which is a, also a really cool thing. Um, but the trade-off is then the size of the tables. I mean, you saw from the file there, massive amount of tables. You need one entry in each table for every character you're going to match, because it's just a lookup. But that's a fixed cost. And you know you, that's a good trade-off to take. Um, the other thing you need to do is make sure that you match everything you need to match. Uh, so in your rules for your uh, Lexa there, you make sure you're matching your new line characters, matching your Unicode characters as well, so that if someone sends you a Unicode uh, file, you can work with that. Uh, and the other thing is that you need to handle unexpected output. So they can have a catch-all rule which says, no, bad character, I can't do anything with that, and it throws an error and it can handle it. All right, so we're going to move on to parsing. Before we do, is everybody happy with Lexing? Excellent. <laughs> I feel like setting your homework now. This is good. Oh, gone too far. So what's parsing then? So parsing performs the syntactic analysis. So once we've got our stream of tokens, we're now going to verify uh, that, the, that the file or inputs matches the syntax that we expect from the file. So we, we've now no longer dealing with character level. We're dealing at something slightly higher. We've got a higher level abstraction to work with. And all we need to do is pattern match on our stream of tokens, which we've got from the Lexa. Um, we've also got other information from the lecture as well. That's given us token offsets, and uh, we can also look at the contents of the text as well. So we can see what that block, what that identifier is, what uh, what the, the value of things are. The syntax is described by a grammar, uh, and if you're lucky, the file format you're trying to parse has a well-described grammar. And if you're not lucky, there isn't one, and it's just a bunch of text, which is harder. Um, but a grammar is usually represented as a recursive hierarchy of rules. So the top level will be the, the whole file, and then it kind of gets um, broken down and composed hierarchically into, uh, into other structures and, and finally down to tokens. So for example, with my shader file, given a sort of uh, an abridged shader file on the right-hand side there, the grammar to describe that on the left would start with shader file, which uh, is a block which has got a keyword, a string literal, an opening brace, I can have an optional properties block, an optional tags block, 
some more stuff which is abridged, and then our closing brace, uh, and that's it. But we recursively defi define things. So the properties block is defined, and the properties block can be a properties keyword, an opening brace stuff, um, abridged. Um, so for example, in that one, I've actually got a, a property star, which is zero or more properties, and then the closing brace. Same with the tags block. Tag keyword, opening brace, um, <coughs> content, zero or more tags, and braces, and it builds up and it gets nice and uh, big from there. Uh, I can show you. The parser as well, so this is, actually this is a bad idea because there's a lot of extra boilerplate in here. Um, let's go find file. Okay, so there's our top level rule which is shader lab file and it's got a uh, shader command in here. Which again, okay, so there's our shader command rule and the shader command rule is a shader keyword followed by a shader value and a shader value is a block itself, and that's got a shader value name, which again is a recursively defined rule, uh, a token there, which is left brace. So the, the way this one works is that anything in capitals at the start there is actually a token. Anything in lowercase is, a, is another rule, another block. But we've got uh, left brace, properties. Uh, question, yes? Okay, so the like yeah. So the question is, um, we're looking at structure in the parser right now, <laughs> and the structure of the file. Um, does the is the lexer concerned about structure as well? So if you get an invalid file in the lexer, does that fail? Does that go wrong? And the answer is usually no. But and it's also there's a, that's a good difference between a lexer and a parser because the lexer doesn't care about the ordering of the tokens; it just cares about identifying tokens. Uh, and so you could have, you know, 23 left braces followed by a comment, an identifier, um, a return keyword, and everything. Those are valid tokens, but they're invalid. It's an invalid program. So the, generally speaking, the Lexa doesn't necessarily care about the structure of things. It's not quite true because the Lexa can have states, so it can recognize the start of a token. Um, so, for example, there might be regular expressions in your Lexa which only match under certain conditions. Um, I'm struggling to think of something now. There might be... Yeah, so you can see here I've got these things on the left here. These are different states. So when I enter a, a bracket, I have to parse things a little bit differently. Sorry, I have to lex things a little bit differently, match different um, regular expressions for a couple of things because they're only valid in certain contexts. And so you can have different contexts in Alexa, but it doesn't really care about the overall structure of the file. Only the parser itself does. Another question. <coughs> Yes, the parser is ignoring white space and new lines. Great question. Love it. We'll come back to that. <laughs> um, yeah, so, uh, okay, so going back to this, we, we will come back to it, don't worry. Um, parsing is, uh, unlike lexing, parsing isn't, uh, which is, it is kind of a solved problem, to be honest. There's lots of solutions to the problem. There's uh, lots of different ways of writing parsers and generating parsers. There's two main styles, really, uh, top-down and recursive descent, uh, and bottom-up recursive ascent. So one going down, one going up. So top-down is uh, you match the whole file first, and then you recursively go down into smaller and smaller things. Bottom-up, you match tokens and slowly build things up from there. So if we're talking top-down parsers, so uh, imagine a C-sharp file. So we're probably all familiar with C-sharp files. Uh, hopefully, um, the, the file is split into things like, you know, you've got using statements at the top, then you've got like a zero, zero or more namespace declarations. Namespace declaration is split into zero or more class declarations. Class declaration is split into zero or more method declarations, method declarations, so on. You know, so it's, it kind of collapses down into something smaller and smaller constructs, but recursively. So that's top down and that's recursive descent. Uh, and sort of uh, pseudocode, it would be kind of something like this. So you start with parsing the shader lab file. Um, the first thing you would try and do there is parse the shader command. When you're trying to do that, the first thing you would do then is match the token, uh, the shader keyword token. That would pull in the token from the Lexa uh, and match it, and if everything's good, we move on. We then parse the shader value. That recurses down into uh, a, um, a method which will parse the, the, the shader value name, match that, match the string literal for that, 
match the opening brace, and then look at the next token. It might be a properties keyword, in which case go and parse the properties. It might be the subshader keyword, go and parse the subshader, or it might be the tags keyword, go and parse that. So we've got sort of optional uh, recursive descent in that. Now, I've shown you that in pseudocode because the generated code has a lot of boilerplate in it as well. Um, So this is the parse file method, and it kind of it takes up the whole file, uh, whole screen because it's doing extra stuff. It's doing error handling and, and and so on. But we can see that the first thing it does here is parse shader command, and then parse shader command itself will do a match against a shader keyword, uh, and then it will do parse shader value here, uh, and so on. So it, it does the same sort of thing, but there's a lot of boilerplate there, so we're not going to look at it. Moving on. Uh, does, does that make sense for top-down parsers? Yes, question there. So the parser file will be also compiled in the same way? Convert it to a code file? Yes, yes, I, I should have said that. Um, so I, the, the way it works with Resharper, we do have a parser generator, yes. And so that is a, an input file to a parser generator. It's custom. Um, I'll, I'll co come back to that in a sec. Um, right, so bottom-up parsers are an entirely different beast, and they start at the bottom and work their way up. Instead of starting, you know, saying, match, I'm going to match the whole file and then match smaller and smaller pieces, they start small and end up matching the whole file. So this works with what's called the shift-reduce algorithm. I'm not going to go over this because it's difficult to, uh, to, to show, to demonstrate, and to debug as well. It's, it's, it's tricky. But the idea is something like, you know, you match a token. This could be uh, an integer, uh, and then what you do is you shift it onto a stack. And that's the shift of the part of the shift reduce. So you might have something which has got an integer, the, the plus operator symbol, uh, and you've just matched another integer, you shove that onto the stack, you shift that onto the stack. You then reduce that, and you say, ah, I recognize that pattern, that's an expression. So I'm going to reduce that down to an expression. And then you get your next token, which maybe it's another plus symbol, and it might be another integer, and you shift those on, and then you can reduce that again, you get another expression, and you build things up from there. It might be uh, a variable assignment, so you kind of reduce it down to a variable assignment, then you reduce it down to a method declaration, reduce it down to a class declaration. And so you're building a bigger structure from a smaller thing to start with. Okay, so um, I'm going to, as I say, I'm going to skip over the shift. Yes? Is there any uh, uh, preference of doing top down or bottoms or any benefits and drawbacks? Um, benefits and drawbacks of top down and uh, bottom up parsers. There are, in some respects, yes, there are some grammars which can be best handled with different types of parsers, um, and it's all to do with recursion of, of something. So if you have an expression which is defined, for example, as an expression plus expression, all of a sudden you're recursive there, because your expression could, to, to match that, you have to match expression, but to match expression, you have to match expression. Uh, and so certain parsers are better at handling that than others. Um, and <laughs> the, the, you can go down an entire rabbit warren of Wikipedia pages on those. It's, uh, it's a lot of fun, <laughs> for some definition of fun. Um, building a parser, uh, you've got a couple of choices here as well. You can do a hand-rolled parser. You can write one yourself, um, uh, or you can use a parser generator. If it, it's actually uh, easier to write a parser than you'd, you'd think. You know, the lexer is the harder thing to, to write. Um, building a parser, especially if it's a top-down recursive descent parser is a very mechanical process. Parse file, parse command, parse keyword, parse this. It, it's it's mechanical process. Um, it's fairly straightforward to build. It's also easy to understand. If you're reading it, debugging it, it's easy to follow. It's easy to understand. Um, you can also use a parser generator, such as Yak and Bison. Yak stands for yet another compiler compiler. Um, and was a companion piece to, to Lex. Uh, Bison was a newer version of Yak, probably named because it was Yak, you know, an antler. I've no idea. It's an acronym of something. And another tool for language recognition. Ah, perfect. Another tool for language recognition. Because I was thinking antlers, and these like bisons don't have antlers; they have horns. Um, but they are usually bottom up. So they they normally they're normally table driven. They're generated. They're table driven and uh, work as a bottom up uh, recursive ascent parser. And they are also harder to understand. Uh, harder to understand. Harder to but to debug as well. So in ReSharper, uh, we've got that file I was showing you there. It's a custom file format, and we generate 
a, we actually generate the same sort of thing you would do as a hand-rolled top-down recursive descent parser. It's um, a it, mechanical process just gets uh, generated. There's another uh, type of parser that I'd like to, to mention though, uh, which is parser combinators. This is an interesting, uh, an interesting way of doing things where you build a parser by combining other smaller parsers. And so you can have, it's, this is more of a sort of functional programming style of doing things. You'd have a function which says, uh, say parses a string, uh, and then you have something which is gonna parse a bigger construct, and you combine parse, the, the string parser function and mash things all together. Uh, it's kind of similar to how link works in the you know, sort of functional and it's compositional and uh, all of that, but um, you know, it's, it's, it's also very easy to use, but there's a sort of similar cost associated to that because you're building your parser at runtime. And so you're combining all those things at runtime, and so then there is a cost to that. That might be absolutely fine. We do have uh, some usages of parser combinators in ReSharper, but we actually save it for our build <coughs> tools rather than for as you type analysis. So an example of this is uh, fparsec for f sharp. Uh, this is an example from Phil Trelford's blog. Um, and given uh, a couple of sort of um, primitive functions, p string to parse a string, p float to parse a float, and spaces one to parse one or more float, uh, sorry, one or more white space characters, you can define a new parser, parse forward, which will match the string fd or forward. You can see that the sort of uh, angle brackets pipe symbol would be or, matching or, followed by one or more spaces, followed by uh, a float, uh, and if you match that, do this function, which is gonna be creating a, an instance of this. You do a similar thing with left and right, and generate two, you've, we've now generated three parser functions there, and then finally we've got p command, <coughs> which combines those all together, and it says match either uh, the forward, or left, or right. And so we kind of combine those all together to, uh, to give us a final parser, which we can then invoke and parse things. Are we okay with that? Marvelous. There's a similar thing for C Sharp, which is using uh, link syntax. Personally, I find this less readable than the F Sharp version, um, but it's, it's available and it's there. And it's, interestingly, we use, this is the library we use in, uh, in ReSharper. But that's doing a sort of similar sort of thing, parsing many white spaces, parsing one character, uh, or a digit or white space and concatenating everything and building up a parser at the end of it. So I'm not gonna spend too much time on that. Question, yes? So is that doing the lexing and the parsing? Uh, it is actually, yes, that's a very good point. This is doing the lexing and the parsing. Uh, as that one is at the same time as well. Um, yes, very good point. I hadn't kind of twigged that before after splitting everything down in responsibilities and everything. Yes, so this one will be parsing uh, white space and it'll just do those particular things there because it can actually build things up from smaller uh, um, values. Right, so that's kind of an overview of lexing and parsing, and so we're all experts at this now. Um, and the, um, what then comes in is some of the interesting problems that you kind of encounter, and the gotchas and everything. And as was uh, mentioned before, white space and comments is a good one. So we'd expect this to work. So we've kind of got a grammar on the left-hand side there, um, the shader block there, it's a keyword, followed by a string literal, an opening brace, some stuff which is abridged, and a closing brace. And that's what we're seeing on the right-hand side, and that looks like it should match. But the actual input we get is usually very different. We get a whole bunch of carriage return, line feeds, white spaces, weird line feeds, we've got comments, and we've got all sorts of stuff. And if we lex that, we get a whole bunch of stuff, uh, including our comments and new lines, which doesn't match what we said it was gonna be in the grammar. There's an easy answer to this. We filter things out. We, we have a, a lexer which just returns, so our lexer returns a stream of tokens. What we do is we create a new lexer which kind of decorates that, decorate a pattern, uh, and it filters out our white space and comments. Um, so ReSharper, as I said, has um, its tokens, instead of being integer values, they are singleton object instances. One of the things we've got on there is an is filtered property, so it makes it very easy to filter things out. So yeah, so we just wrap that, uh, and we filter out uh, any tokens that we don't want to see. So then the parser, when it's looking at its stream of tokens, doesn't have to worry about comments, doesn't have to worry about white space. It just says, do I have a keyword followed by a string literal, followed by a left brace, some stuff, and a right brace, and that's a lot easier to match. But the question we need to ask is, is it safe to lose the white space? 
Uh, and that kind of depends on what it is we're building, why we're doing the, this parsing in the first place. If we just want to get stuff out and we're interested in the uh, contents of the file, you know, because it's a custom file format or whatever, that well might well be yes. But my answer is no. I'm building for an IDE, and I've got a different set of constra constraints with this. So I'm trying to build sort of code editor features, syntax highlighting, code folding, and so on, error highlighting, um, inspections where you put a squiggly in the, the right place, refactorings and formatting, and so on. So I need to work with both the contents and the structure of the file because the contents gives us our semantic information for navigation and so on, and uh, here's an identifier and what that is and so on. Um, but the structure allows us to report all our inspections. So if I know what the structure of the file is, I know where to put a highlight. So I know where the squiggly line goes. So I know how to rewrite stuff. I know where to put in new lines if I'm <coughs> reformatting code. So I need to represent the structure of the file as well as the contents. So that's going to be syntax trees. So if we're using a syntax tree, uh, I can use inspections to walk the tree. I can refactoring it just by rewriting that tree and then sort of basically re-serializing that as text. So who thought of abstract syntax trees? Yeah, no, it's not abstract syntax trees. Um, the, an abstract syntax tree is abstract. That's the, 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 it doesn't represent the contents of the file. It represents what the file does effectively. So these two nodes are the same. The, the brackets on the left are implicit in the structure of the, um, of the tree itself because the brackets are used for precedence. But we've already got that because of how the nodes are, are laid out. <laughs> what we need to use instead are concrete parse trees. And this is just a, a data structure which includes everything, all of the new lines, all of the white spaces, all of the um, uh, comments, and everything we've got in there. So basically, we need those filtered tokens. I'm, I'm trying to build a syntax tree, a, a concrete parse tree, but I've filtered out a whole bunch of tokens. I need to get those back in. And so I have to add in an extra process at the end of my parsing thing to reinsert those missing tokens, um, add all the white space and comments back in. Uh, and that slide, that's boring. It's, it's a mechanical process. Basically, you, you walk your tree, and if there are any gaps in the, uh, um, the tokens that are there, you compare it with the original lexer and put them back in. And it's a, it's a mechanical process. It's fairly straightforward, and it's uh, good to go. <coughs> But then I hear you say, what about what a significant white space? So if we just strip out our white space when we're dealing with, uh, with code, how do we deal with something like this, with F-sharp? F-sharp doesn't have, um, well, in, depending on configuration, it doesn't have end-of-scope markers. There's nothing to tell you that the method has finished apart from indentation. Same with the for loop and the uh, if statement. So we filtered out all of our white space, but we need significant white space. So how do we deal with that? And the answer is to actually insert tokens. We're in control of the lexer. We can do interesting things there. When the lexer sees that there is an indent, we can put in a new token, which is zero width. It doesn't have any particular size, so it's not going to affect the output, and just say, here's, uh, um, here's an indent. And when we're coming out the other way, and it's shorter, we can put in a token which is outdent or unindent. Is it outdent or unindent? Nobody knows. It's, it's, it's tricky. Or we can call it block start and block end to, to sort of save things there. Um, and then the parser can then match these tokens in the grammar. So the, the, the parser can say, um, you know, I've got an if, if token, some stuff, then match indent, match a whole bunch of stuff, and match finally outdent and carry on. <coughs> and this then kind of, um, it, it was a bit of a, uh, not exactly a light bulb moment, but a reminder of how flexible code is and how good everything is because we can do interesting things with the Lexa and with the code. And just because it's generated doesn't mean that we can't work with it. So other examples are things like with F sharp. The, if you see two followed by a, 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 a full, full stop character, that's a float. But if it's in the contract of square brackets two dot dot zero, that's now a range operator. So you've kind of got to figure out now how to match whether it's a float character or an operator. And what we can do instead is, well, let the lexer match um, int dot dot as a specific token. And then we can uh, put another decorator around our lexer and say, whenever you see int dot dot, split that into two tokens. So we kind of post-processing this token stream. And so uh, who's who the gentleman who asked about uh, extra things on top of the lexer <coughs> and the top of the parser and post-processing and things? This is where that starts to come in. We've got flexibility. Uh, with Alexa. A similar example is 
regular expressions might not capture everything. We might have to do things differently. Shader Lab has nested comments, and you can't do that with regular expressions. So when I said that people who've been lying to you about HTML and regular expressions, they're telling the truth, really. Don't do it. Nested things in regular expressions doesn't work, and you definitely can't do it in the Lexa. So you do things differently instead. You have a rule which matches the start of the comment, <coughs> and the action for that, instead of just returning a token, the action finishes off lexing that comment. And that's custom code. You can just put whatever you want in there. And that code can then count the number of start and end comment characters to handle nested comments. So there's a lot of flexibility. It's kind of, I don't really know how to sum this up succinctly, but it's, you don't have to blindly follow the rules with these things. You don't have to blindly follow the pattern of just return a token, of just forcing everything into a regular expression. You can do extra things. You can do more complex things, and you can get it to work, uh, work with you. Uh, another interesting problem, which uh, encountered with the, the Shade Lab file format, is that some tokens can actually just appear anywhere. And a good example of this is uh, C sharp files as well. So if you have hash if debug and hash end if, they can appear absolutely anywhere. But if you can have tokens that appear anywhere, how do you put those into the grammar? How does the parser deal with that? Because the parser couldn't even deal with comments or white spaces. So how does it deal with surprise tokens? Um, so in uh, Shade Lab, we've got this CG program token here about halfway down, and everything else is sort of shaded green behind that. That can appear anywhere in the file format, which makes things uh, interesting. It's essentially a preprocessor token. To make things more interesting, which I'm not going to dwell on, is the block inside CG program is actually a different language and can be parsed completely differently. But that's an entirely, <laughs> we're not going to go into that. But the way to deal with this is, is two pass parsing. You, you, kind of, you have a preprocessor. You treat it like a preprocessor. And you have uh, a first pass which finds these preprocessor tokens, um, parses them, does something with them, and then gives that to a new filtering lexer which can skip them. And then you parse as normal, and the grammar just doesn't see it. The parser doesn't see those surprise tokens. At the end of that, though, I need to put those back in, and so it's exactly the same process as the missing tokens inserter, and they just get shoved back in, and everything's good. Error handling, that's not right. That's more like it. Error handling is more of an art than a science. Error handling is, is kind of tricky. Um, is, there's also surprisingly little written about this as well. There's about three or four uh, papers and, and, um, and things, articles written about how to do error handling with, when parsing. Uh, why do we care? Why do we care about error handling? Um, if you're parsing a custom file format, you want to have some useful error reporting. Uh, and you also want it to be sort of minimal error reporting. You don't want to have to say, you know, if there was a, a missing token, the rest of your grammar is going to fail, you know, because you, you've, you can't match something and it's all gone horribly wrong. Um, then you need to be able to just sort of say there's an error here rather than saying your entire file's messed up. <laughs> um, in the IDE, we especially need to do that because as you type, your code is broken. You don't type in complete constructs. You type in, you know, characters. And so for a large part of the time in the IDE, your code is incorrect. And you don't want the whole file to be highlighted and um, uh, um, shown as an error. So you've got a couple of choices. You can fail fast. You know, if you're, if you're parsing a custom file format, you might just want to say, oh, there's an error right there, and leave it at that. But you're not going to be reporting any following errors. You don't be reporting once, and somebody could fix that. And it's like, oh, there's an error there now as well, and it's not great. Or you can try and recover. You can try and do error recovery. So uh, what happens when there is an error? Um, in my case, the parser is going to add an error element into the tree. So instead of having an element which represents a method declaration or a block or a keyword or whatever, I have a custom element in my tree which represents an error. The error spans um, everything that's been uh, parsed so far, um, which could be the, the incorrect token or, or the thing we're not expecting. Uh, and in that case, for, for, for myself with my shade lab files, that means highlighting that in the editor is trivial. Basically, I just look for an error element in the file. If there is one, put a highlight for that whole token. How do we find an error? Sounds kind of obvious. The start is, is obvious. You, you don't match something. The parser is trying to match a particular token, and it doesn't find it. So the, either the token is missing, or it's uh, something different, and, it's, uh, and there we go. Um, but where does the error stop? 
that's the tricky thing because if you've just kind of got one token missing or one token extra, everything's shunted along and it's going to be very hard then to find where to stop. So you need to try and recover. But how? What are the options for you? And it comes down to sort of three things, basically. You've got three options. You can go into panic mode, which is a great description for it. Um, this is what the papers call it. It's not just me. Um, and that is basically you eat tokens until you find something you recognize. So if there was an error in a method declaration, for example, you would go into panic mode and say, oh, quick, something's gone wrong. I need to find a closing brace. And as soon as you find a closing brace, it's ah, fine, and carry on parsing. It might work. It might not. Um, another option you can do, which works surprisingly well, is token insertion or removal or substitution. That's kind of like playing what if. It's saying, oh, I've got that. I wasn't expecting that. What if I did get it? And the other option you've got is actually encoding the rules into the, the grammar. So uh, panic mode, as an example, in my shader file here, um, I'm trying to parse a property here. And a property is one of those lines. Uh, and it's supposed to be the name followed by stuff in brackets, equals, and then a value. On the second line there, I've actually got something going wrong um, because I don't have any brackets. And so it's gone into panic mode. It is said, I'm not expecting that. I was expecting brackets. I'll panic until I find the um, end of that particular expression, which is the end of line. And so it just eats everything. And so that's, that's fine. We've kind of recovered nicely. But if you look at the second example, where somebody's put in uh, an extra bit of text in their you know, syntax error, it tries to, uh, tries to match up again and find the next thing it can. Um, and if, and the next thing it can find, actually, is then the start of a new rule, which is going to be an identifier for a next property. But that's not the identifier for a next property. That's still part of this line. And so it gets it wrong. And so all of a sudden, now we've got two errors, and it's, it's kind of messed up. So panic mode will kind of get us part of the way there, but it's, it's not brilliant. Token insertion, however, is a good, uh, a good chance. And it, it kind of gets uh, a lot of, uh, it does capture quite a few uh, of the issues. So example here is we've got a missing closing brace uh, at the end of the word color there, at the end of the color keyword. Uh, and what we do in that case is we assume we got it. So we said, what if we did get it here? And I carry, try and carry on parsing from that. And I say, well, OK, um, I'm expecting a, a right parenthesis character. I didn't get it. It should be followed by an equals character. Let's pretend I did. And we actually look at it here. Now we see there is an equals character. So it's like, fine. And you carry on parsing. And it actually recovers very, very quickly there. And we've got a very small localized error. If that fails, we can do the opposite. You know, perhaps somebody's typed too many characters, and we can do token, token removal. So for example, um, if we tried inserting a character and it didn't sync back up, we can then try and say, well, perhaps there's an extra character there. Uh, and I was expecting equals, but I got another right parenthesis. What if I didn't get the right parenthesis? Um, what would happen next? Look at the next character. It's equals. It's correct. And we sync back up again, and we move on. And the final one, then, is, uh, is an interesting one in that you can tell your parser to expect an error. Uh, and you can encode it directly into the parser. If there's going to be a common place in the file where there's usually an error or where it's obvious or you expect that something could go wrong, um, you can put something in there to, to, to catch it directly. So uh, a good example is a, an empty block. So if something which has got a left and right brace character and you know it's going to be empty, you also know that somebody's going to put something in there because that's what people do. So you kind of code something in. You, you actually put in a rule there to say, match me something. But if you do match anything, make it an error. You know, it's, it's just kind of, that's like the sigh thing. It's like, fine, I'll deal with it. So um, to start to, to wrap up now then really, there are a couple of other things which are pertinent only really so to an IDE, um, which are, are also very interesting though, incremental lexing and parsing. And the idea of this is really that you don't want to parse the whole file on every change. So if you've got a nice big file and you hit one character, you don't want to have to reparse the entire file, relex the entire file. So you only want to just reparse the subset, the smallest subset that encloses the change. Um, you also want to avoid relexing it as well. Uh, and that's actually easier than it sounds. You just go walk up to find a, a block that's dealing there. You've already, you, you have to cache the lexer output first of all. But you've already got that information. And you know how to parse, and you just start parsing from that point on until you finish, you close the block, and basically resync everything up, and you carry on. It's uh, a surprisingly sort of straightforward mechanical process. Uh, and the other problem then is um, composable languages. 
uh, and there's, there's several ones of these that can have things like injected languages. So that's like the CG program problem that uh, Shader Lab has, where the CG program block is a different language again. And you can solve this in a couple of ways. Your par you can extend your parser so it expects that, and it has effectively a whole extra set of rules embedded in it to deal with that. Uh, or you can um, have support for that. So, so the IDE, for example, can have support for that saying, okay, well, I'm gonna treat this as a separate file. And you have just a, a different parser and a different thing, treat it as a separate file. You can have things like um, inherited languages. So TypeScript is a, a superset of JavaScript, for example. So when you're typing, when you're parsing your JavaScript, uh, sorry, your TypeScript files, that can also work with valid, um, did I get that right around? When you're parsing a TypeScript file, that can also be valid JavaScript. Uh, and the way you can do that then is it's useful if you are using a hand-rolled parser or a, uh, a um, mechanically a parser, a generated um, top-down recursive one where you can override certain parts of it. So you can extend a parser class just like you'd extend any, old, any kind of class. Uh, and then the other ones would be interesting are uh, nested languages, things like JavaScript or CSS nested inside HTML or Razor and C Sharp, and you can sort of switch in from that. Uh, and that one, again, you kind of have some sort of inheritance type thing going on or uh, a mode switching, which can sort of uh, multiplex, as it were, between the two. Razor and C Sharp is a particularly interesting one because they can be embedded in, in, inside themselves several times, which uh, gets messy. So. To sum up then, how do you parse a file? <laughs> Don't, just, just, just avoid it please, it's not worth it. Stick to, H, uh, to, to XML, stick to CSS, stick to YAML, stick to a general purpose language, um, but there. But if you do, there's lots of fun, there's lots of interesting things you can do with it. Uh, so finally, some, some links then, if you want to see what's going on with the Shade Lab file, uh, it's all open source, it's on the ReSharper Unity um, GitHub page on uh, JetBrains account. Uh, and then there are a couple of links there which are pretty much the only things I could find on error recovery for, uh, for parsers, which is, you know, considering the size of the internet, three or four articles is, is uh, pretty impressive. Uh, and that brings me to the end then, really. So um, if anybody has any questions, uh, please let me know. Otherwise, thank you very much for attending. We have a question, yes. I'm sorry, I missed that. Yeah, so the question is, if the tokens are integer values, how do you get to the contents of the token? Uh, and that's actually a, when the, the stream of, I kind of lied a bit when I said it's a stream of tokens. It's a stream of tokens plus offsets plus, well, tokens plus offsets. And given the offset, you can then get the text there. So, yes. Uh, does somebody else have a question? Yes. Yes. So the question is that w some of the things are recognizing things based on where they are with the neighbors. So the that is not far removed from convolutional neural nets. Then my answer is I have no idea. <laughs> it, I don't know. But that would be cool. You know, artificial intelligence file parsing. That's cool. <laughs> yeah, there, there's your PhD right there, I tell you. It's, uh... Anyone else? No? Cool, very good. Thank you very much then. <laughs>